I want to quote a scripture from Isaiah 58 and I want to paraphrase it. Um, the title that we're talking about is Living Boldly in a Post-Christian Culture. None of us would ag disagree that we live in a post-Christian culture. And that's the challenges that we face for our children. Um, God told the Isaiah prophet, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and if I paraphrase it, tell my people their transgression and the entire nation their sins. Now, God told Isaiah to do that, and I do think it was an easy job for Isaiah. I think it was a very challenging job. And I think we give good kudos to men of God who are loved by God, women who are of great faith, who stand outside of their times, who live ahead of their times. Now, God tells us that he knew us before the foundation of the world. He tells us there's reason, purpose, hope and design in our existence and that you and I have hope and that he has set times and seasons according to his will. When the disciples said to the Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? In the book of Acts, Jesus said, it's not for you to know what the Father has appointed the times for, for these sort of things. But we do know that God knows the future. And more than that, he knows who you are becoming more than who you were in the past. If you, if you don't want to know me in the past, I um, thank my wife, Rebecca, sharing half my life. She knows, you know, but, but God sees what we are becoming in Christ and that's very important. The reason why that's important is because the Lord spent a great price on us, the price of the, the Son of God. And so because of the price that God has spent on us, he equips us with resources, opportunities, gifts, and most of all, the Holy Spirit. Now, on a physical level, you have a bank account. Somebody said you have 86,400 seconds per day. You can spend it how you like it, you can waste it or you can use it, but you can't claim any of it for tomorrow. And it's very interesting that is because that's on a physical level, on a divine spiritual level, what really matters with a God who exists out of time, space and matter is that he comes and dwells with us and in us by the Holy Spirit and um, and his personal presence is with us. And that's why all of creation yearns and longs for the revealing of the sons of God, the children of God. It's very powerful. And you'll see as we're going, living boldly in a post-Christian culture. What does it look like? What can we learn about people who lived prior to us in the rich tapestry of biblical history and how it speaks to us today? Because we see faithful people amidst the, the scene of the rise and fall of great empires. The ancient Israelites were called out of the Egyptian empire and archaeologists marvel at the architecture, the size of the stones, the mummies, the gold, the richness. And in, in Egypt, built on the black, back of Hebrew slaves, God calls his people out of that environment. We also have people who grew up in Babylon, Persia, the Greek empire, Roman empire. Scattering of God's people in enormous times. It's like the David versus Goliath type of imbalance. And yet these insignificant people, because God's grace was on them, left a legacy and a testimony for you and me today. Their calling was to live counterculturally. God gave them divine laws. He gave them annual festivals that pointed to and foreshadowed the, sa the saving grace of his son. And yet they faced extraordinary odds of their time. And the miraculous legacy is that despite their faults and their failings, they have a testimony. We read the scriptures and we follow and we base our lives based on this constitutional document, the Holy Bible. Very, very powerful. For example, you think about the time of Moses growing up in Pharaoh's court, spends 40 years in the wilderness of Midian. Then he leads a slave people out of this great civilization. Is, it, is that an easy task? That's a daunting task. That's why Moses is... His, I'm a stutterer, I'm just not up to the task. What about David? You know, he killed Goliath and sent an entire army fleeing. Esther, a woman who stood up against impossible times, risked her life, and you know what Mordecai said to her? Who knows if you were born for such a time like this? And the question that I'm asking us today, who knows that if you and I are born for this moment, to live in the great epic time before Jesus returns. Today's a call for you and I 
to write our own story, face our own battles in our own times and challenges. And sometimes we're not like the sons of Issachar and Chronicles. We wonder where we are, what do we do next, how do we navigate this? Today is a time for all of us in Christ to take our place in history. And that's kind of noble because future generations will be looking back at us, at the legacy that we walk, and Jesus reminds us that it's going to be difficult. You know, I don't like going to church when I hear a sugar-coated level of the gospel, a health and wealth gospel, or some other variant. Because the reality of the gospel, the scriptures are on the screen, for then there will be great tribulation. The disciples ask, what's the time leading up to your return and the end of the age? Such has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor ever will be. Well, King Solomon in Ecclesiastes said, everything that is has happened before, you know, there's an echo of it. But here Jesus says of the, of the tribulation coming, it's never happened before on that scale and never will be. And in verse 22, the Lord says, if those days had not been cut short, and there's God's mercy intervening in human affairs, no human would be a saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days would be cut short. So God's got his hands on everything. You know, I remember he singing a hymn many, many years ago, This is my Father's world. And I used to think, that's not the Father's world. The devil's got control of it. No, God is sovereign. The devil is only very limited what he can do. And so Jesus tells us, this is a time for great faith. And you're going to be rewarded for your faith. He says in Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. There's quite a few scriptures from Matthew today. Jesus says, Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. So then you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and he says, you'll be persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We look beyond the temporal to the glory that's waiting us. What about in uh, Matthew 5, 11 to 12? Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Do you think these days' words are for us today? We're entering those times and the slander and the... And the myopic nastiness is absolutely shocking. Jesus says, how do you handle it? Well, he tells us, rejoice and be glad, because you are on the right side of history. And your reward is great in heaven. And he says, look, they persecuted the prophets before you. It'll happen again in that sense. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus and not on this world, your reward won't be diminished by whatever you face. So what are the challenges that you and I, collectively as a body of Christ and individuals facing today? What is the Holy Spirit whispering to you? And how do we understand the times in which we live? When, where and how are we to take our stand? That's the question that we often ask ourselves. Um, it's no random occurrence that the Father has called you. It's no random occurrence that he has placed us in the hands of Jesus and Jesus chooses us and equips us and strengthens us. And our response, because we're here today, is simply because of the virtue of faith. We believe his word and we recognise the grace that's afforded to us. That's why we are listening today and this is why we're sort of interested in this sort of material because we want to stand on the virtue promises of the kingdom and the righteousness of God. And we want God's purpose to be established in our lives so that you and I can go to... My dad recently contacted me and gave me some words to read at his funeral because he wants his legacy to stand on the sure promises of Jesus. And all of us, as we get towards the end of our age, wrestle with the reality of what legacy we'll leave behind. God, I believe, is preparing us all. And sometimes that preparation goes over many, many years, over many, many decades, sometimes in unpredictable and unforeseen circumstances. Now, I don't know where each of us listening today have been through our, our Nebuchadnezzar's big furnace or whatever trials you've been through. See, God called Moses into action, not as a young 40-year-old in Pharaoh's court. He trained him for another 40 years in the wilderness of Midian, tending sheep. And right when Moses was 80 and thinking he was past it, God says, I have another 40 years for you. Now you're ready for action. So you don't know how God's going to work. God called David into action, but God prepared David. Moses was prepared for the great job of leadership in Pharaoh's court and in, in, in Midian. But David was prepared by bringing a, a, a lion down and a bear who came to steal a sheep. So God prepared him. So don't diminish the things that happen in your life that God will prepare you. For example, Hadassah, we know as Esther, stood on an insurmountable battle when genocide was issued against her people. And she had someone to help her. God didn't leave her alone. There was Mordecai who'd wait outside the king's palace to hear word of how Esther was doing. 
And so she had a powerful mentor in her life that equipped her on that spur of the moment. What about Paul? Why did God choose Paul, Pharisee of Pharisee? Well, he's trained rigorously at the feet of Gamaliel, and then God trained him further over three days of blindness in Damascus. Didn't take 40 years to sort Paul out, like it did Moses. So our circumstances may differ, and your story might be differ, different from your, your neighbour's story. That's why we need to give grace to one another, because we don't know. But if we read the book of Hebrews, we see a legacy in the book of Hebrews that's very, very powerful, and our story has been written alongside those faithful saints. So I want to leave you with two points today that will help us on our journey. The first one is we must recognise Jesus as Saviour, Lord and King and enter into that personal covenant relationship, abide with me, walk with me, listen to me, come to me, says Jesus. Because if we do not get that personal covenant relationship with Jesus Christ right, we will miss everything. We'll miss our moment in history, we'll, we'll misinterpret the times, we'll make all the mistakes in the world. In other words, there's no other premise that we can start from. This, you know, to come to know the Son of God, to know the Son of Man, to know his identity, to let him abide with you. Jesus wants to fellowship with you, dine with you, to live in you. Now, there are examples from Scripture that are very powerful, that really speak to us. Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus. He's with his travelling companions, he's got evil in his mind, but his moment of change was when he asked the question, Who are you, Lord? There's a lot in that. I'm thinking, why did Paul say And the Lord said to him, you've been wrestling this for some time. And later on, you know what Paul says? He's talking to one of the churches and he's talking about his education and his learning, etc. He said, I count all this as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So Paul was on the, finally on the right trajectory, for all his, but his wasted energy in the past made him appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter had a public confession. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This was public. And the reality is that if we are committed and united in Christ, you and I will have similar moments of public testimony. Martha exclaimed, you know, when Lazarus had died, Jesus and Martha are having this conversation. She says, yes, Lord, in John chapter 11, verse 27, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who's coming into the world. There's a woman of faith, and we read elsewhere of her faults. She knows who Jesus is. And if you know who Jesus is, and you understand that he's the, the Son of the Father, begotten of the Father, you have stepped onto the plate of history that will guide you in God's will. What about Moses? Moses said, if I go to Pharaoh and say, the God of your forefathers have told me to let my people go, and the Lord says, I am that I am. And that moment that Moses received that word changed him on extraordinary trajectory. It says that Moses talked with the Lord like a friend face to face within the cloud. That's powerful. And you and I need that kind of connectedness with the Lord. Nathaniel's moment. I'm using a few examples. Nathaniel meets Jesus for the very first time and propels him into discipleship when he says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. So he recognises the Son of God, he recognises his, his King of Israel, and then Jesus introduces him to the Son of Man. Son of God, King of Israel, and then listen to what Jesus is. You'll see the, the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Nathaniel was propelled into ministry. So I want to ask you, have you reached that moment in your life of open, candid confession of who you are in Christ and who Christ is to you? Because a lot of us, like in my journey, I was a little bit like Nicodemus. I held off for a long time before my public open confession that I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart, mind, soul and strength. Because Nicodemus wasn't prepared to say son of God or son of man or king of Israel. He said, we know you are a wise teacher. can only come from God because of the miracles. Now we see Nicodemus getting past that. His journey was slower. He makes a public affirmation when him, he and goes together collectively to take down the body of Jesus on that particular day. Number two, one is a public confession of Jesus Christ. Number two is to be bold in Christ. And I'll show you some scriptures that will really help us on this journey. You and I, in the book of Hebrews, says that we boldly can come before the throne of grace that we might find mercy in time of need. 
So you go courageously and say, Father, help me. Father, I don't have work, I'm unemployed, I've got cancer, my friend is dying, whatever it is. You do it with boldness. And that's beautiful. Now that boldness then translates into other lives. And um, Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.12, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Now I could spend a lot of time on that. When you have hope, you rest your faith and, on that hope, and that transmits in what you say and do. So Paul says, we have such a... He looked forward to the resurrection. He looked forward to meeting his Saviour face to face. Now, I want to ask the question, what does it take for us to be bold? Paul says in Philippians 1.14, now he's writing, we believe, from prison. He says, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the world word without fear. So Paul is writing to those at Philippi and he's saying that the, because of his imprisonment for the gospel, more people were becoming more bold rather than more afraid. So let's say I, as your pastor, was put in prison because I spoke the gospel and somebody didn't like it and took me to court. Would you be more afraid to speak out publicly or would you become more bold? So Paul, a senior pastor, was put into prison because of the gospel. It was wrong for what he was saying. They didn't like him. And he said, most of the brothers, so not all the brothers were bold, but most of the brothers became confident, not in themselves, in the Lord. There's a difference. And became much more bold to speak without fear. That's one of the lessons that we can learn today. It could be a third point. Don't have fear. Be bold, but don't be afraid. Because the moment you're afraid, the devil has won that battle. And that's the reality today. You know, when we look at the book of Hebrews 11, we see faithful people who stood on their testimony. They, they stood their ground and their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And sometimes some of those characters are quite ragged. Look at Samson. Not the most noble man for the first three quarters of his life. But he spent the last part of his life in prayer, in suffering. You know? The question that we have to ask, what about us? Now you might think, I'm not courageous. I'm not eloquent. I'm not capable for this kind of stuff. I just want to live a peaceable, quiet life. You know, it doesn't matter because Jesus has already won the battle. The game is totally different. Jesus likens us to salt and light. Now today we had the dedication of the children. Salt is a preservative. And God has always preserved faithful people throughout the world and called us to be, as parents and grandparents, the preserving agents of the next generation, to preserve them in Christ, to pray for them. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Now salt, you know, then he says you are the light of the world. Salt is something that happens, it's not out there in the limelight. It's the little things that you do that's not noticeable. Then in verse 14 he says, Now you are the light of the world. Light confronts darkness. Light clears darkness. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, so it's out there. So salt is a subtle preserving agent happening within church, family, community, between you and God. And the light is right there in the public scene. In the, in, so there's two elements to it. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, in verse 16, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And I want to tell you, this idea of people seeing your witness today giving glory, we read in Scripture, in the great Revelation, John sees an innumerable multitude coming out of great tribulation, and they're dressed in the lambs, dressed in white, and praising God. Why? Because your testimony today didn't mean anything to them. But one day they'll remember, and they'll give glory to our Father in heaven. Salt is so essential, brothers and sisters, to the next generation. We had the blessing of our two little dear, dear daughters. They feel like my daughters. They're really beautiful. Um, the faithful acts that you do every day in every way. And we are entrusted as custodians of the oracles of God and the gospel of the good news in Jesus Christ because we live in an emerging wicked generation and really challenging times. Jesus said he'd never leave you. Jesus said he'd never forsake you. He'd live in you. He would dine with you. He wants you to abide in him and he and him and have this kind of fellowship. 
So when it comes time for you to stand a moment and have a testimony, either in a work environment, either Channel 7 with a microphone pointed into your face, whatever the circumstances are, he says, don't worry about what you're going to say because you have the Holy Spirit, the presence of God living in you, and you will be given from above. And I brought that scripture up on the screen from Matthew 10, verse 19. When they deliver you over, it's not as if you're going to escape this. You're going to have opportunity at some stage to have a testimony. Don't be anxious how to speak. You're like Moses. I can't talk to Pharaoh. I've got a stamina. I haven't spoken to any, many people for 40 years. Don't be anxious how to speak or what you are to say or what you... For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. So you don't need intellect. Eloquence. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who is speaking for you. And that really makes the words of Jesus, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the end. Paul puts a different way on it, still saying the same thing. And he touches on the subject of salt in our speech. Walk in wisdom, Colossians 4 verse 5, towards outsiders. So, you and I for most time during the week, we walk, have to walk with outsiders, people who don't know the faith or not true to the faith if they do know, making the best use of the time of this 86,400 seconds per day. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. There's the idea of salt, working to preserve the word of God in your heart. And so with graciousness and love in your heart, you can allow God's word to speak through you. So the question that I want to raise, are we faithful in the small, unseen matters of our lives. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in very much. The little, you know, everything we say and do is accounted against Jesus' blood. And so therefore there's a high calling for you and I to speak only our Heavenly Father's words in the name of Jesus. Um, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? had a little bit of dishonesty in a public scene and they lied to the Holy Spirit. They were not disqualified instantly from church involvement. Not only just church leadership, but they lost their lives on the occasion. You know, God can allow the fullness of his purpose to manifest in your life sooner or later. And God wants that to happen to us sooner than later. You and I are living in unique positions because we're living in a time, as Alex was said, never in human history can I jump on a plane and 22 hours later step off in London. Never in a time can I speak to this microphone and this camera and brothers in Sydney and Japan and Victoria and elsewhere. Never before. Knowledge shall increase. Many shall travel to and fro. But despite all that, we also live in uncertain times. And throughout human history... Now, one of the things about the times in which we live is that if you study history and you study archaeology, humans through most civilizations that I know of always had some kind of deity whether it was the worship of the king or the emperor, whether it was gods, look at indigenous art, and there's all kinds of the woggles and snakes and the spirit of the ancient in American Indians, whatever it was. People always had a sense of the supernatural, the sense of God, the sense of the eternal, the transcendent, the metaphysical. But for the first time in history that I know of, on the back of socio socialistic ideology and on the back of scientific hypothesis, a new faith has created, been created called atheism. That there is no God, that we, our children are being indoctrinated through education and, and media, that we all evolve rap, random happenstance, that there's no higher moral law and that there's no reason for being, no purpose for life. And you and I can match that with rising rates of, of suicide. In fact, one of the challenges our youth face today is most of published literature have taken out references to God or faith. It's all completely secularised. Now, I mentioned earlier that when I was a boy, now this is going back 50 years, when I was a boy, we sang God Save the Queen as our national anthem. So we, God was part of that public psychology. When I attended school assembly, we all paused, 1,200 boys and girls, and said the Lord's Prayer. So we were built a nation that was built on Christo-Judaic values, and we echoed those in a public setting, even though most boys didn't care about it. 
very difficult time, different times in which we live. And if you are an academic applying for a position in academia today and you say that you're a Bible-believing Christian, you will not get that academic position because you stand for something that doesn't fit the criteria of a leftist, godless generation. Can I say something? How have we fallen? A real tragedy. That's why as a church, the salt that preserves, the light that shines is so important. And do you know who the prime targets are in this world? It's our youth. The mechanism of politics, education and media are focusing on our youth in every possible way. And so the call is for you and I to step into this equation, to live faithful, godly, bold lives. Number one, by prayerfully embracing those challenges, seeking grace and wisdom and allowing the quiet times to meditate on where we stand in history and what our contribution is. God wants you and me and all of us to work tirelessly in the gifts he's given us to strengthen one another, to strengthen the body of Christ and to do what we can. You know, there's no room for cowardice. You may be faced with a certain situation where you could stand and have a testimony and you might think, this is not the hill that I want to be crucified on. I'll wait for another opportunity when I'll speak up. You've already lost that battle. You may have an opportunity because it won't get better the next challenge that we might face will be worse. May we out of compassion and out of courage as well as commission physically take a stand for Jesus in our time. And just like Martha and Mary and others who said, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the King. Just like Joseph, just like Daniel, just like Moses, just like Esther and others. Now, of course, what does Jesus say? You'll be made fun of. You'll be persecuted. That's not the sugar-coated gospel. In fact, not only persecuted, Paul was prosecuted. You know what Jesus said in John 15, verse 20? Remember the word that I said to you. When Jesus says remember, he says, hold it dear. A servant is not greater than a master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Now you notice Nicodemus was one of the Pharisees. Sometimes your light shining against antagonism, can call one or two of the antagonists, like Paul, like Nicodemus, to extraordinary faith, based on your example. You know, that's what counting the cost of baptism is. And the courage it takes for Moses and Pharaoh's court to saying, let my people go. The courage of David, skinny farm boy, to say to Goliath, how dare you defy the living God? That's Daniel saying, I will only worship God. That's Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego saying, we will not bow down to your idol and we don't have to be careful how we answer you in this. <laughs> the king turned purple in rage. He heated the fire up seven times. But you notice they said, we don't have to be careful how we answer you. That's like putting fuel to the fire. A jerry can of petrol on an existing fire. But they spoke out of faith and they spoke out of trusting God and their legacy speaks to us today. You know, there's no room in the Lamb's Book of Life for cowardice. So where do we start? I'm going to give you some takeaway points. And the takeaway points are almost self-evident. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed. This is a go-to phrase that I've been coming back every, almost every week. In word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything you say and everything you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then give thanks to the Father through him. What does that mean? That means pray a little bit longer than you normally would. Linger in God's presence. And then when you get up off your knees, carry in your presence the Father's radiance. You are a son of the Father. You are a daughter of the King. And carry that with you. Another point. Pick up the phone and ring someone. Because what you're doing, you're doing it to Jesus. You remember Jesus said, a glass of cold water, you've done it to me. Another thing, you know, these are small salt things. When someone's talking to you, give them attention, make eye contact. It might seem self-evident, self but sometimes we're guilty of that. You know, one of the things that I'm learning to do is premeditate to speak wisely and kindly 
when I'm persecuted or wrongly accused. That's really hard. And if you don't premeditate, what comes out of your mouth will be combative in the wrong way. Remember you are holding on, upholding Jesus' name. So premeditate ahead of time. Know the times in which we live. Another item that we can do, that's the salt of the earth, is to pray for the next generation. Pray for those young ones who will be standing in our place, our children, our grandchildren, those within the faith community, friends and family alike, because we live in dangerous times and they need our prayers. I am here because somebody prayed for me. I know that. And I know the Lord heard their prayers. And the greatest legacy that we can give the next generation is our wisdom, our prayerfulness, our leadership begun on prayer our guidance, our empathy, and our unwavering vision in what the Lord has promised. We all need mentors. Remember, Joshua stepped into big shoes, but he was mentored by Moses. Paul invested his life in young Timothy. Timothy was afraid, he had tummy pain, he was uncertain, but he had a legacy of Lois and Eunice, his, his mother and grandmother. Mordecai invested his life in Esther. When he couldn't see her, he stayed outside the king's gate because he was worried for her in a pagan environment. Jesus mentored Peter, John and James. Study their lives and all the other disciples. Paul said, older women mentor and teach younger women. We have a lot that we can do. A lot that we can do. You know, there's a huge battle waging, brothers and sisters. And we are in the front line, whether we like it or not, because we uphold Jesus' name. Jesus says, um, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Then we wonder, what does that mean? I personally believe that we shine the light into very dark places, and the darkness can't stop the light. And you and I, you know, there's a motorcycle group called Hell's Angels. They're a rough, tattooed, bad, drug-dealing people. But you and I are messengers that push past the darkness as messengers of God. And this is what Jesus said, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. These are not my words. These are Jesus' words of the age in which we live. So what he says, be wise as serpents. Be innocent as doves. Understand the timeline that we live in. The battle's not yours. The battle's been won in Jesus. And I'm sharing this message because it's a testimony to all of us. Victory is assured in Jesus. May we be bold in living these days in a post-Christian culture. May we be bold in our witness and testimony because the seeds sown in faith show something. John was given a prophetic vision in the book of Revelation and he sees an innumerable multitude coming out of the difficult days that lie ahead, of every language, tribe and custom and ethnicity, so vast he couldn't number them. And he talks to the angelic messenger, who are they? And he said, these are they who have come out of great tribulation. They're dressed in white, righteousness of Christ. And they're singing salvation songs to the Lamb. How did they get to that point? Through your testimony, through my testimony, living in uncertain and challenging times. May your boldness in faith speak to many and allow those seeds of faith to bring many more to Christ. Praise and glory and honour to God as we've been able to celebrate today. Sabbath, here in Western Australia, assembled together in Sydney. And let's pray that God will guide us and strengthen us in the next week ahead as we take to heart the challenging times in which we live and able to live boldly in a post-Christian culture.